While many dinosaurs were actually quite small, some were comparatively massive, bringing us to the question of the hour, and that's what did people think when they first pulled huge dinosaur bones out of the Earth? To begin with, it's generally thought that humans have been discovering dinosaur bones about as long as we've been humaning, and it appears that at least some of the giant creatures of ancient legend likely stemmed from the discovery of dinosaur bones and fossils, and the subsequent attempts of ancient peoples to explain what they were. For example, 4th century BC Chinese historian Chang Ku reported the discovery of massive dragon bones in the region of Wuchen. At the time, and including for many centuries after, including some still today, the Chinese felt that these bones had potent healing powers, resulting in many of them being ground down and drunk in special elixirs. As for the exact medicinal purposes in the 2nd century, Shenong Ben Chao Jing states, Dragon bone mainly treats heart and abdominal demonic influx, spiritual miasma, and old ghosts. It also treats cough and counterflow of qi, diarrhea, and dysentery with pus and blood, vaginal discharge, hardness and binding in the abdomen, and fright epilepsy in children. Dragon teeth mainly treats epilepsy, madness, manic running about, binding qi below the heart, inability to catch one's breath, and various kinds of spasms. It kills spiritual disruptors. Protracted taking may make the body light enable one to communicate with the spirit light and lengthen one's lifespan. While fossilized bones may not actually make such an effective cure-all, all things considered, the classic depictions of dragons and our modern understanding of what certain dinosaurs look like are actually rather in the ballpark of accurate. Moving over to the ancient Greeks, they are also believed to have stumbled across massive dinosaur bones and similarly assumed they came from long-dead giant creatures, in some cases seeming to think that they came from giant human-like creatures. So, moving on to better documented history, in the 16th through 19th centuries, the idea that the Earth was only about 6,000 years old was firmly entrenched in the Western world, leading to these fossils creating a major puzzle for the scientists studying them. Even Meriwether Lewis of the famed Lewis and Clark expedition found a dinosaur bone in Billings, Montana, but in his case, he decided it must have come from a massive fish, which is a common way they were explained away given that no creatures that then walked the Earth seemed to match up. The various ideas thrown around during these centuries were described by Robert Plot in his 1677 Natural History of Oxfordshire. Are the stones we find in the forms of shellfish, be Lepidsu generis, fossils, naturally produced by some extraordinary plastic virtue latent in the earth or quarries where they are found, or do they rather owe their form and figuration to the shells of the fishes they represent, brought to the places they are now found by a deluge, earthquake, or some other such means, and there, being filled with mud, clay, and petrifying juices, have in tract of time been turned into stones as we now find them still retaining the same shape in the the whole with the same linations, sutures, eminescences, cavities, orifices, points that they had whilst they were shells. Plot goes on to explain the idea behind the plastic virtue hypothesis was that the fossils were some form of salt crystals that had, by some unknown process, formed and grown in the ground and just so happened to resemble bones. However, Plot argues against this then popular notion, stating, Come we next to such stones as concern the members of the body, amongst which I have one that has exactly the figure of the lowermost part of the thigh bone of a man, or at least of some other animal, a little above the sinus where it seems to have been broken off. Chewing the marrow within of a shining, spa-like substance of its true color and figure in the hollow of the bone. After comparing the bone to an elephant, he decided it could not have come from one of them. He instead concluded, It remains that, notwithstanding their extravagant magnitude, they must have been the bones of men or women. Nor doth any thigh hinder, but they may have been so provided it be clearly made out that there have been men and women of proportionable stature in all ages of the world, down even to our own days. Thus, much like is thought to have happened with certain ancient peoples, he decided some of these bones must have come from giant humans of the past. During Plot's era, the Bible's mention of such giants was often put forth as evidence, such as in Numbers, where it states, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim, and to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. 
Though the bone plot was describing has since been lost to history, he left detailed drawings from which it's thought to have come from the lower part of the femur of a megalosaurus, literally a giant lizard. But before it was called the megalosaurus, it had a rather more humorous name. You see, in 1763, a physician called Richard Brooks, studying Plot's drawings, dubbed it Scrotum Humanum because he thought it looked like a set of petrified testicles. To be clear, Brooks knew it wasn't a fossil of a giant scrotum, but nevertheless decided to name it thus because apparently men of all eras of human history can't help but make genital jokes at every opportunity. While hilarious, in the 20th century, this posed a problem for the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature when it eventually came time to formally classify the Megalosaurus as such. The problem was, of course, that Brooks had named it first. Eventually, the ICZN decided that since nobody after Brooks had called it Scrotum Humanum, even though he was the first to name it, that name could safely be deemed invalid. Thus, Megalosaurus won out, which is unfortunate because discussion of the rather large Scrotum Humanum would have provided great companion jokes to ones about Uranus in science classes the world over. Moving swiftly on, humanity continued to have a little clear idea of what dinosaur bones were until William Buckland's work on the aforementioned Megalosaurus in 1824. As for the word dinosaur itself, this wouldn't be coined until 1842 when British scientist Sir Richard Owen noted that the few dinosaur fossils that had been scientifically studied at that point all shared several characteristics. For the curious, those species were the Megalosaurus, the Hyliosaurus, and the Iguanodon. He further concluded that the fossils could not have come from any creatures that currently roams the Earth and thus came up with a new name, dinosaur, meaning terrible, powerful, wondrous lizards. Of course, it should be noted that despite being knighted for his life's work in 1883, Owen was renowned for stealing other people's ideas and calling them his own, in at least one case, even after having previously ridiculed the person he stole the ideas from, and that was paleontologist Gideon Mantle. In several instances, Owen would attempt to take credit for some of Mantle's pioneering work on the iguana on while downplaying Mantle's contributions in the process. To add insult to injury, it is speculated that the much more distinguished Owen actively worked to stop some of Mantle's work and papers from getting published. To further illustrate Owen's character and rivalry with Mantle, after near financial ruin in 1838, his wife leaving him in 1839 and his daughter dying in 1840, Mantle would become crippled after a fall from a carriage on October 11, 1841. Previous to the accident, he had frequently suffered from leg and back pain, but the source of it was dismissed as likely due to the long hours of work that he put in and things like that. Things got worse when a coach he was on crashed, shortly before which Mantel leapt from it. In the aftermath, his former pain became extreme and he ceased to be able to use his legs properly. As he writes, I cannot stoop or use any exertion without producing loss of sensation and power in the lower limbs. And could I choose my destiny, I would gladly leave this weary pilgrimage. He later laments in his journal, My long probation of suffering will be terminated by a painful and lingering death. Okay, so well, what does any of that have to do with Owen? To add insult to injury, after Mantel died from an opium overdose taken to help relieve some of his constant and extreme pain, several obituaries were published of Mantel. They were all glowing, except for one. This one was anonymously written, though analyses of the writing style and general tone left few among the local scientific community with any doubt about who had written it. In it, Owen starts off praising Mantel, stating, On Wednesday evening last, at the age of about 63 or 64, died the renowned geologist Gideon Algernon Mantel. It goes on to note how Mantel's memoir on the Iguanodon saw him the recipient of the prestigious Royal Medal. Of course, later in the article, Owen claims Mantel's work, for which he won the medal, was actually stolen from others, including himself. He states, The history of the fossil reptile for the discovery of which Dr. Mantel's name will be longest recollected in science is a remarkable instance of this. Few who have become acquainted with the Iguanodon by the perusal of the Medals of Creation would suspect that to Cavia we owe the first recognition of its reptilian character, to Clift the first perception of the resemblance of its teeth to those of the Iguano, to Conybear its name, and to Owen its true affinities among reptiles, and the correction of the error respecting its build and alleged horn. The article then goes on to outline Dr. Mantle's supposed various failings as a scientist, such as his reluctance to the revelation of a truth when it dispossessed him of a petty illustration, as well as accusing him, once again, of stealing other people's work, stating, To touch lightly on other weaknesses of this enthusiastic diffuser of geological knowledge, we must also notice that a consciousness of the intrinsic want of exact scientific and especially anatomical knowledge, which compelled him privately to have recourse to those possessing it, produced extreme susceptibility of 
any doubt expressed of the accuracy or originality of that which he advanced, and in his popular summaries of geological facts, he was too apt to forget the sources of information which he had acknowledged in his original memoirs. It finally concludes, as it started, on a compliment. Dr. Mental has, however, done much after his kind for the advancement of geology, and certainly more than any man living to bring it into attractive popular notice. It's commonly stated from here that, out of spite, Owen also had a piece of Mantel's deformed spine pickled and put on a shelf in the Hunterian Museum in London, where Owen was the curator. However, while this was done, the examination and study of the spine was done at the behest of Mantel himself. Thus, an autopsy was performed, and an examination of Mantel's spine showed that he had a rather severe, and at least at the time, peculiar case of scoliosis. As to what was so interesting about this case, one of the physicians involved, Dr. William Adams, states it was discovered that the the severest degree of deformity of the spine may exist internally, without the usual indications in respect of the deviation of the spinous processes externally. In other words, in other such cases, it was clear that the spine was not straight from visual observation of the person's back where a curve could be observed. Mantel's spine, however, exhibited severe scoliosis, but in such a way that upon external examination it otherwise appeared straight. To Adams' knowledge, such a thing had never been observed before, but if Mansell had this particular brand of scoliosis, surely many others did as well. But the question now was how to detect it. Mulling over the problem inspired Dr. Adams to come up with a method to make such a deformity visible with external examination, thus giving the world the Adams forward bend test, which many a school student even today has no doubt recollections of being subjected to periodically. Going back to Owen, as to why he seems to have hated Mantel so much, this isn't fully clear, though it may simply have been Mantel's work sometimes resulted in showing Owens to be incorrect in various assumptions, as well as jealousy of a scientist that he deemed inferior to himself, or maybe it was just that Owens was a bit of a dick. As noted by famed biologist Thomas Henry Huxley, it is astonishing with what an intense feeling of hatred Owen is regarded by the majority of his contemporaries with Mantel as arch-hater. The truth is, Owen is the superior of most and does not conceal that he knows it, and it must be confessed that he does some very ill-natured tricks now and then. Of course, if you steal other people's work long enough, eventually you're going to get caught, especially when you're one of the world's leading scientists in your field. Owen's misstep occurred when he was awarded the prestigious Royal Medal from the Royal Society for his supposedly pioneering discovery and analysis of Belemnites, which he called the Belemnites Oeni after himself, and gave no credit to anyone else for the ideas in the paper. It turns out, however, four years previously it attended a geological society get-together in which an amateur scientist by the name of Channing Pierce gave a lecture and published a paper on that very same creature. While Owen was allowed to keep his medal even after it was revealed he'd stolen the work of Pierce, the rumors that had similarly borrowed other ideas without credit and this subsequent proof resulted in the loss of much of his former academic prestige. Things didn't improve over the following years, and Owen was eventually given the boot from the Royal Society in 1862, despite his long and rather distinguished career. While he would never again do any scientific work of significance, his post-plagiarist career did really prove to be a huge boon for those who enjoyed museums. You see, up until this point, museums were not really places that were open to the public, and to get access, you usually needed to be an academic. These were places for research, not for random plebeians to just gawk at things. After losing any shred of respect from his peers, he eventually devoted his energies into his role as superintendent of the Natural History Department of the British Museum. Among other things, as superintendent, he pushed for and helped develop London's now-famed Natural History Museum in London. He also instituted a number of changes, such as encouraging the general public to come and visit the museum at their leisure, and devoted the majority of the displays for public use, and had labels and descriptions added below each display, explaining what each was of so anybody, not just the educated, could understand what they were looking at, etc. Many among the scientific community fought against these changes, but he did them anyway, giving us the modern idea of a museum in the process. In any event, after Owens, Mantles, and their contemporaries' work finally revealed these long-extinct creatures for what they were, interest in dinosaurs exploded, resulting in what has come to be known as as the bone wars between rival paleontologists in the 1890s, which got so heated that some paleontologists literally resorted to dynamiting mines to beat their rivals to discoveries. The most famous such rivals were Othniel Marsh of the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale and Edward Cope of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. While the pair started out friendly, even choosing to name species after one another, they eventually became bitter enemies, and when they weren't doing everything in their power to find dinosaur bones as fast as possible, they were writing and giving talks in each other's work. They also made efforts to get each other's funding cancelled, they stole discoveries from one another, and whenever
whenever possible, they tried to destroy the other's work. In the end, the product of this rivalry was the discovery of a whopping 142 different dinosaur species, and for the record, Marsh discovered 86, Cope 56.